people pay good money to see this movie. When they go out to a theater, they want cold sodas, hot popcorn, and no monsters in the projection booth. Everyone pretend podcasting isn't boring. Turn it off. Turn it off. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. On this special episode, I'm speaking with Goran Topolovic. He currently serves as a board director and programmer at Subway Cinema, and he's one of the folks who programmed the 10th Old School Kung Fu Fest, Sword Fighting Heroes Edition, which plays the Metrograph Theater in New York, April 21st to 30th, 2023. It's a great lineup of films, and I guarantee it's something you'll want to check out. I hope you enjoy the interview. Tell me about you. I want to know a little bit more about your history. I know we don't have too long to talk today, but I want to know about your history and how you got involved in programming Asian films. I mean, are you familiar with Subway Cinema as an organization? I've heard of Subway Cinema for years and years and years. I had a friend that lived out in New York and he would always talk about Subway Cinema. One of the original founders of Subway Cinema, right? So, you know, we were just a group of fans. We used to hang out in, uh, you know, Chinatown theaters in, in Manhattan and you know, watch double features for like six bucks. So, you know, martial arts and, you know, Stephen show comedies and, you know, you name it, right. Category three films <laughs> and, you know, slowly, you know, the Chinatown theater started closing and there was only one left for music palace. You know, there was a group of us about 10 or 15 who were kind of trying to see, oh, is there any way to save the theater? There was a lot of interest in local community. And it's like, well, the next best thing we can do is like, maybe we just show these movies ourselves and. Okay, so the next meeting we all have, you know, everyone should kind of bring uh, their checkbook and, you know, let's let's get going. And then five of us came to the next meeting and we all kind of checked for thousands of dollars and how that's how Subway Cinema started. And our first event was a Johnny Tour retrospective at Anthology Film Archive in the fall of 2000. And it just kind of grew from there. You know, we all just learned things by doing, you know, none of us were doing any of this professionally before. And we had other jobs and it was like a hobby that kind of got out of control. Then we ended up launching the New Occasion Film Festival in 2002, which grew into really the, the leading North American festival dedicated to Asian popular cinema. Now we're no longer at a little New Occasion Film Festival ourselves because, uh, you know, we just reached a point where once again, you no know, day jobs, only so much work you can do. So we kind of scaled back and now the core Subway Cinema, it's just kind of the three of us remaining of the original founders and what we do now is our focuses on retrospective programs just kind of smaller film series special screenings just kind of having fun with it and sharing that sense of fun with the audiences and uh you know the focus on retrospective programming is because we want to introduce these great classics of the asian genre cinema to to new generations and younger audiences right so this year at the old school kung fu series that you have going on you're concentrating on 
swordplay. Now, does swordplay, is that necessary for a film to be called considered wuxia? Yes. I mean, it's really the cult of swords. You know, it's, it's very important to, to, to the wuxia. And now wuxia is both a literary and cinematic tradition, right? It's really the oldest cinematic genre in Chinese language cinema. But prior to that, you know, you have a very long tradition of, of literature, right? Stories about knight errants, right? And I think that's probably the easiest way to describe it because the word wuxia is kind of very difficult to translate from Chinese. There's really no equivalent word that captures all the meanings in it, but the term that we usually use is kind of the, a female or male knight errant, essentially. The wuxia movies, they, they started being made in like 1920s. Uh, and that was, you know, when Shanghai was the center of the, the film industry, you know, before it all moved to Hong Kong, right after the, the war. But yes, I mean, sword is very important component. So there's usually a lot of sword fighting and it's also about, you know, the, the virtue and righteousness and some of the wuxia gets into the areas of fantastic and mythical and, you know, heroes that seem to have supernatural powers. So, you know, you have, you have different strains of wuxia, you know, within wuxia, you know, over, over the decades, it has also evolved and developed. When we talk about the modern wuxia or, or so-called new, new school wuxia that really was kicked over by Shaw Brothers in 1960s, right? So the two pivotal works for that, it's the King Ku's Come Drink With Me and Cheng Che's The One Our Swordsman, which was also like a, you know, probably like it was the biggest box office hit at that time, right? Kind of smashed all, all, all the records. And so the King Ku and Cheng Che are sort of kind of the, the fathers of the new school cinematic wuxia with Zhang Che kind of focusing more on, on the masculine archetype, while King Hu focused more on, on the female archetype of Knight Errant and developing those characters. I'm really excited to see that you are showing the uh, documentary about King Hu, the, the King of Wuxia. That looks like it's going to be amazing. Yes, I know it's very long, but we are going, if you're going to come to the theater to see it, there is going to be an intermission, so, <laughs> so don't worry. They're basically two movies, like the, in one. So the first part talks more about, you know, King Hu's movies and, you know, we hear from critics and scholars, we, we hear from his collaborators, we hear from people like John Wu and Choi Hark and Samuel Hong. Uh, they all talk how, you know, influential King Hu was on, on them and their, their careers later. And, and then the second part, it's more about King Hu as a person and his life and all the challenges that he's had. And even in terms of his own kind of where's his home or identity, right? Because he lived, you know, he lived in Beijing, he was in Hong Kong, he was in Taiwan and again to the US. And he tried to make a movie about the, the Chinese workers, you know, working on the railroad, right? Building the railroad. So that was, that was the last project that he was trying to make. But unfortunately, you know, he, he passed away before that could materialize. So, yeah. So it's, it's really a great documentary and it really, you, you gain appreciation for how much of a, of an artist he was and a visionary. He really lived for his movies, you know, every, every, every detail. I mean, you're just born that way. It's not something that you can, you know, go to school for. Right. So I think three and a half hours for a documentary about King Hu is very appropriate. Cause I seem to remember trying to watch raining in the mountain and it was about that long as well. And he wasn't one for shorter films too often. No. Right. So if you look at a touch of Zen, right. So that's like three hours. And initially when it was released in Taiwan. It was released as two parts. It was part one released in 1970 and part two in 1971. And for the Hong Kong release, they cut it, they put them together and they cut it to two and a half hours. How did you decide which movie you're going to show this year? Because there are so many, you know, even within Wuxia, like you're saying, there's the masculine, there's the feminine, there's different eras of it. There's you know, different eras of filmmaking. There's just so many different things that you can do. How did you narrow that down into the films that you're showing, which is, a, by the way, a very, very strong program. That's always the challenge. There's so many great films to choose from, right? So I think our focus this time was more on the kind of Taiwanese uh, wuxia. So King Hu, after making Come Drink With Me for Show Brothers, he you know, wasn't happy with how things went with, with Show Brothers. Yeah, I mean, we hear a lot of these stories, right? So he decided to go to Taiwan and he he made Dragon Inn uh, for Union Film in Taiwan. And Dragon Inn made so much money, it really built Union Film as a company. 
as a production company. And then they started making a lot of other wuxia films with King Fu as kind of chief of production in a way and kind of setting the house style for all these other films that show. So I, so I think at least eight of the films in our lineup are from Union Film. So they're Thai, all Taiwanese productions. And then, and then we threw in a couple of kind of black and white pictures, kind of it's a bit of a discovery of some of the earlier examples of, of Taiwanese wuxia. So, and especially the one that a bit of a discovery for us is the Vengeance of the Phoenix Sisters, which, which is actually a Taiwanese language film. It's not Mandarin. Like all these other films that we're talking about, they're part of the Mandarin language Taiwanese film industry. But there was also a Taiwan language film industry that like in the 50s and the 60s, right? So it's not as well known outside of you know, Taiwan as, as their Mandarin language films. And that's something that we're also kind of hoping to dig deeper and, into and in, into the future because they made a lot of different genre movies there as well. So, so yeah, you know, that, that was sort of like the thought process in terms of kind of trying to, to give an eye, like a little overview of, of the Taiwanese uh, genre traditions of when it comes to wuxia. You also ha- have to be careful, like to have a right balance and right number of films because you don't want to exhaust the audience, right? I mean, it's uh, so we felt that, okay, if we say 15 film stops, 12 in theater, three online, two weekends, a metrograph, you know, that should be good. <laughs> and I'm so curious as far as the state of preservation of these films. I mean, how difficult or easy is it to find good prints of these these days? Taiwan Film and Audiovisual Institute, formerly known as Chinese Taipei Film Archive, has been doing... Uh, great job in, in, in restoring a lot, a lot of these classic films. And it's really thanks to their effort that, you know, we're able to, to show some of them and, you know, we're all getting them on DCP because the, the, a lot of them are digitally restored. You know, a, a lot of the King Hu stuff is, is already available and it's accessible, right? I mean, you know, you have the Criterion Collection, you know, Bl- Blu-rays and it's on their channel and there's, you know, Arrow Video and the film movement has, has also released a number of uh, King Hu's films. But then what's more interesting is these other union film productions that not really easy to see for people, or they wouldn't even know like where to go to, to, to see them. So I, I hope that people take advantage of the fact that we're showing some of these rarely screened films to come out and check them out and they'll have a fun time with it. I have to say, I'm very jealous because I wish I was in New York to be able to go down, sit down in a theater and just watch so many of these movies on the big screen. It's got to be such a treat and with an audience. I mean, I can't even imagine how much fun it would be to watch these movies. These movies are meant to be seen in a theater with an audience, not, not sitting at home and, and just streaming. Right. So curious to see how, how many people show up. Right. Because especially after the pandemic, it's really hard for us to say like, okay, is there an audience? Are they going to come? Who is the audience? Right. So it's, it's like, we're starting from scratch. You know, that doesn't matter that we've been programming films for 20 years, just the pandemic has, has changed all the rules. And I think all the, all the movie theaters and cultural organizations are still trying to figure it out. How do we get people back? Right. Well, giving them something that you can't see normally, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. And yeah, I'm going to recommend this to everybody I know who's within the sound of my voice. I can get to the theater to see these because it's a fantastic program. Goran, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. And thank you, Mike. Thank you for the opportunity.